the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, the second chapter we started by talking about some Greek words in it, and we focused on the word empty, to empty himself, which was translated in the New King James, made himself of no reputation. This is a Greek word to uh, mean uh, empty, to, to be evacuated. Kenosis. Kenari. Take it. I uh, forgot what was the word we used from the last time. <coughs> so, today I wanted to tell you about something in the letters of St. Paul that's very common. And I want us to pay attention to this because it will help us to understand why we read the Bible. Why do we have a Sunday school? Why do we have a sermon? Why do we need to learn and to see things? There's two types of actions in the Bible. You're going to have always together the vision and the action and they come in this sequence first you see and then you act and the first one uh, has a group of words in, and we are familiar with some of them theology what is theology the study of God what is theoria the vision of God what is theory? Theory? Yes. It's translated when you say theory. You have it written here. Uh, this is from the dictionaries. So, the body of rules, ideas, principles, and techniques that applies to a subject, especially when seen as distinct from actual practice. So, these three words actually are tied together. Theology, Theoria and theory. Theoria is a vision. What's the theory? It's the body of, of work. Yes, it's an abstract work. It's not related to actions. But it can actually be the base of action. The other word that I want to use is praxis. You know, the, the book of Abraxis. Praxis. Praxis is action act the practical side and the application of something such as professional skill as opposed to its theory and the two has to go together why am i talking about this because in the letters of saint paul you're going to have always the two linked together if you look carefully saint paul starts always maybe in philippians he mixed it up you he always start by the theology the theory the theoria the vision and then he goes to say, if you see this, if you agree with me on this, then you should do so and so and so and so. You're going to see it always. Actually, it's not only St. Paul, but also our Lord had said it many times. He said it in a very striking way. Um, so go with me to that next paragraph in the handout. In St. Paul letters, he always starts with theology, theory. Then he moves to application or practice. Our Lord did explain the relationship between theology and practice in his dialogue with the Jews in John 8, 38. What does he say? say I speak what I have seen, Theoria, with my father. And you do practice what you have seen with your father. The speaking here is the action. He, he tells, the, tells us what he had seen with his father. And the Jews, the, at that time, when they're trying to stone him, are praxia, they're acting out what they had seen with their father. So who is their father? He told them there. And what did he tell them? Who is the father that interested in killing? He told them in that chapter, you belong to a father who is the devil. He is the one who was killing man from the beginning. It was not Cain who killed his brother. It was the devil that incited, enticed Cain to kill his brother. So that vision of killing coming from a source and that source then inspires the killing is not God of course so he said that in the, his speech to the Jews in chapter 8 again in chapter 5 he said the same thing in, in, in the Gospel of John for the father loves the son and shows theoria him all things that he himself does practice and he will show theoria him greater works practice than these that you may marvel what does Jesus say Let's say it in a very simple language. I see, I see what my father is doing, and I, I do it. And you see what your father is doing, and you do it. Let's see the works, 
and the works will tell us what, what are you seeing, what are you watching, means what are you imagining in your mind. In our, our practical way of thinking about it, let's say that any man or any girl or any woman faces a situation that had never, she never faced before. And she has no way of understanding how she would act with that. What is the first thing that comes to her mind as a source of finding out how she should act or how should he act, usually? Okay. But if let's say about, uh, about spontaneous reaction. First thing that comes to mind. Hmm? If we are godly, we were thanked for saints, but not natural level or natural man, natural human beings, they would always jump to their parents. What would my mother do in a situation like this? What would my father do in a situation like this? Unless they hate their mother and father so much that they don't want to even think about them. But that's usually the case. We don't think theory when it comes to practice. We think vision. Um, I'm, I'm playing with words here. We think what we saw. How did my father deal with this? And if I lived with my older brother, and I love my older brother, he's my role model, and I'm always thinking, that's my reference. What would my older brother say about this, or my teacher? So that theoria, that vision, gives me the practice. If I don't have the vision, I don't have the practice. Now comes the Bible. Why do I read the Bible? And I have to keep reading it. It gives me forms your mind. the vision. I'm always thinking in terms, it replaces my old way of thinking as a natural man, as what would God do? I'm replacing the old ways of doing things with the new ways that Christ had showed me. Because he said, I'm the way. Because when they told him, show us theoria, the father, what did he say? Don't you know Philippa, that was Philip, that whoever saw me, so my father, right? So if you want a reference to act upon, to do the praxis, remember what I have done and exactly what I've done, you do. And he told him in the beginning, as I have loved you, you ought to love one another. That what you have seen me doing to you, this is exactly. So sometimes people will say, okay, my friend in the church or in the school is doing so and so and so. My response should be, he shouldn't do that to me. It's insulting, humiliating, I should stand up for my dignity. But then I go back and say, what would Christ do? And I need to see Christ doing. And if I see Christ doing, most probably we see Christ doing through the church, through saints, through a relative, through something that is not natural. But if I look into the natural world, I will see only natural reactions. So what he did in, in this one, St. Paul, he said, uh, he started by actually mixing them, a little bit from theory and a little bit from praxis. So uh, let me go with you to chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done, when I'm saying done, what's that? Praxis. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Then he goes to say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it property to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, or emptied himself, emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Where is the vision and where is the praxis? If you can, if you've understood that far, where is the theory, the theory, the theology, and where is the praxis? What about verse seven, eight, and nine? Seven, eight, and nine. What's that? Okay, the praxis is what he had, what we are doing, not what somebody else is doing. 
What am I supposed to do? That's the practice, the practice. So it's almost like you're telling me, give me the practical thing. What is the practical thing? And the practical thing is not that I would empty myself and be in the form of man, right? What's that? Period. That's the vision. I've seen Christ emptying himself. We know, the church knows, that Christ is equal to God the Father in every glory. But we looked at him, and what happened? He emptied himself and came and took the form of man. And not only that, he went all the way to the cross. Why? Not for himself. Why did he do it? For the lowliest, lowest person in the church. He went to the feet to wash. He went to Hades to carry us all. So that's the vision. I've seen Christ. I, I, this is not what I need to do. I can't do that. But I've seen him do that. But what is the practice? It is actually to be... Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. That is the practice. So what I'm trying to say is, we look at Christ as the image of God, and we turn that into a practical thing into our life. And St. Paul's going to keep doing this over and over and over again. And we need to learn the same thing. I look at Christ. How did he deal with situations? How did he handle himself? What was his life like? Life like? And then I turn it into what is suitable for me. That's the practice. So he says in, in chapter 2, he review, reviews with the Philippians the theory of Christ's work in emptying and humbling himself to the lowest point, the point of death on a cross for the church. Then St. Paul turned to the Philippians and asked them to likewise be to be one to another. Let this mind be on you. He showed them what the mind is like, and he's asking them to have the mind in themselves. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is what St. Paul is going to keep doing in all his letters. First, give you a vision of what God is doing and Christ is doing. And then he turns against, again, and then and turn around and says to us, if you had seen this, it's almost like he's showing us a movie. And then he's giving us the commentary on the movie by turning our, our point attention to the practical part of it. This is one thing I want to tell you about in chapter 2. You're going to see this a lot in all the letters. Now, the next one... If you have any questions, I'll stop here. Do you have any questions about this? This is a, 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 a piece to be remembered, to, to memorize, from um, first, verse 1 all the way to verse 11. And he's giving us an incentive. He says, look at what happened to him at the end. So Jesus at the end was highly exalted, very glorified. So the, the lower a person goes, what happens? The higher the person is exalted. Because Christ went all the way down to the most down point, he was exalted to the highest point. What's he trying to say? Think of that. How do you turn this into a practice? You want to be glorified by God? Push yourself a little bit harder. Do a little bit more. Then you would do without thinking too much of your dignity. And think always of the oneness of how others are going to be edified. This is extremely important, I think, for us. And then at the end of verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now such more in my, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm going to comment on this right now. So if you have any questions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. The next verse in chapter 2 that we need to stop at and really look at very carefully is this verse. I want us to, I want you to come up with some questions on this verse. I'm not going to say it. You tell me. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your, your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's wrong with this verse? Salvation has to be worked out with fear and trembling. It's actually two parts verse, and I want to start with the first part, and uh, we'll go to the next part, and we'll explain it even more. But why? Any, anybody got what I'm trying to... What am I not comfortable with? Anybody can guess? Well, you 
fear and tremor already. Yes, yes. I was thinking that the salvation is already done. Is exactly. Confirming it. Exactly. So this is a point that we have to struggle with. What does it mean that the salvation is has to be worked out? Some people would say you're saved once and that's it. What a traditional uh, evangelist would say, even among the Protestant people, they're not really one. So a Baptist, for example, would tell you, uh, there's three points of salvation. And we agree with them on that, but we say, we call them different names. So they would say, uh, you were uh, justified, that's the Baptist I'm talking about. Justified, sanctified, and glorified. That's how we are saved. The first point of uh, salvation is justification. That's at the point of ba baptism. <clears throat> the second, which is a long life work of sanctification. And the third is when you are glorified. When, when we die and we're taken up to heaven in glory. What we say, we don't really make that div division very much as an Orthodox. We say, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. Because my salvation is a continuous process. We completely disagree with any sect who says, you are saved once. And, and that's it. I, don't, I hope that not too many people are thinking this way. Because there's many verses that says, the same way. I want to explain something here. I'm going to explain it before. I'm going to explain it again. We are saved by faith, by by faith and hope. Not just faith. So when he said, uh, Saint Peter says, be, re "Be ready to answer anyone who asks you for the reason of your hope that you have in you." I believe that Christ accomplished salvation for me. But then my life needs some work to attain that salvation that he, get, he got from me. You know, it's almost like we always say this. You got to take it to the best opera in the city. Unless you, uh, you make the appointment and free yourself and put on the right clothes and you go and take the taxi or the car and go on time and, and use the ticket as if the ticket is not done. So somebody had already paid and made the reservation, but you have to have your work. Because of my involvement in the work of salvation, my salvation is not completely assured until I do my part. I have a part in it. I'm not passive. God did not save me against my own will. He saved me and invited me to take it, to receive it. So when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we ask the question, why are we not so sure of our final salvation? Why the fear and trembling? Why the fear and trembling? For the for following reasons, and they're all practical. One, we have sinful inclinations. Our inclinations are not very straightforward, holy all the time. There is also pride and self-confidence and self-sufficiency. We think sometimes we can make it on our own. And because of uh, our lawless because this is uh, what Jesus had said in St. Matthew 24. He says, because of lawlessness that will abound at the end of days, the love of many will grow cold. Living in a world that's so full of sin makes the person so bogged down. Even if they're excited about Christ at one point, being exposed too much to sin, it makes it very difficult for them to keep that zeal and heat. Laziness. Sometimes we're lazy. When you ask a desert father, what are the enemies of spiritual life in general, they tell you three things. And they're, they're very keen about remembering them. Laziness is one. Forgetfulness and ignorance. So either I don't know at all what I need to do, I don't have a vision of my life, and I say this to, to young people especially, you have to have a vision of your life. You need to work on something. If you don't have a vision, you're going to be like a straw in the wind. Number two, when we, are, we forget, we know, we see, but then after a while we kind of lose track of it. And the number three is to be lazy. We know, we see, but we can't keep the energy. So all these things can actually fight our, against our salvation. That's why we need to be, have and maintain a level of fear and trembling. This is extremely important that even St. Paul, who spoke about grace so much, you know, the most 
person in the Bible, the whole Bible from beginning to end, that spoke about grace, gift of God, is the one who said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? Um, any question about this? Yes? Well, he used to combine the fear and trembling several times. He mentioned Ephesians, he mentioned also in Corinthians, same okay. thing. Fear and trembling. Do something, something, fear and trembling. So it's, it seems it's a mindset that he has, he always combined these two words together. Being a, being a Jew, I think I always think of St. Paul as a traditional Jew. Mm -hmm. Fear and trembling was the status of the Israelites at Mount Sinai mm -hmm. when they received the commandments. Mm -hmm. God wanted this from the beginning. He wanted them to have that type of reverence. Reverential. Not to be scared. Reverential. It's so reverential that actually people actually tremble. Ah, you know, you know, this reminded me of the Quakers and the Shakers. You know, how uh, one of the sects of the English uh, Christians who came to America, running away from the persecution, was the Quakers and the Shakers. And the Shakers and the Quakers wanted uh, people to have a confirmation. You know how different denominations in the Protestant world have a sign of the first. Uh, the day they are saved, the sign of the Shakers and the Quakers is the the trembling. If you don't tremble, you're not saved. So I think this is one of the verses they would take as a proof. Um, there is a second part to this one, which I want to... Any, any question on this? Yes? I'm, I'm a bit confused. Yes. I, I see it as a fine line, a very fine line. It's Salvation is done, as you said, someone had bought the ticket. Uh, if I don't take it, then what will the ticket do to me? Mm -hmm. But I have to kind of accept the work of Jesus on the cross, and this is the first step of the road. But the road is just to ensure that I get there safely and in a good way, but it's not that if I go astray sometimes, it doesn't mean that my salvation is gone, because my salvation is always confirmed from Jesus. Okay, very good. Actually, this is important, but I, I would like to go into a topic that's very hot. For me, it's very hot. It's the, the difference between hope and faith. To me, this is like one of the biggest mysteries of the New Testament. You know how the biggest verses in Christianity, the three biggies, the, the Catholics would call them, the, the uh, theological virtues. What are the theological virtues? In Christianity, St. Paul spelled them out. But these three stand. Faith, hope, and love. We cannot be Christians without the three. What is faith? And what is hope? You don't understand faith without hope, and you don't understand hope without faith. Because in the definition of Hebrews, faith is the substance of things Hoped for. Al Iman who was your God. And the in the Hebrews they link it together. What does that mean? If we understand this, I think we understand this verse and many other verses. So for example, um, I'll give you an example. The student in a, a, a very good student, excellent student, knows that his teachers and the school system is very fair. He believes that one hundred percent. What would he need to do? He wants to be something very big in the school. He wants to be the first in his class. He just needs to do what they tell him. He needs to work hard. Yeah, but he just does it. Yes. He has to do He it. needs to work hard, but would he also believe that he would be the first in the class? Yes. He would hope to be the first in the class based on his faith in the system. If he doesn't believe the system, he wouldn't work. Right. It's illogic. It is. So the faith is the substance, is the thing that makes me hope to achieve. So I need both. So if I say God told me there is heaven for you, for those who work on their salvation, then God established that as a substance, something 100% sure. What's my job? To work hard to get it. Then that's why the, the work, that's the word he uses. Work you out your salvation in fear. So the two work together. As the more I advance in, in my life with Christ, what happens to that hope? 
let me think of hope as percentage. So I start with that much. And then as I work through it, and I'm coming closer and closer, what happens? My hope gets, and then the day I am about to give up my spirit, my hope becomes complete, perfect. Does that make sense? Let's go another example. Because I think once one, one thing you can do, and not my words, just do this study. Go and look at everything that has to do with eternal life or the age to come and see which word that the apostles use. We can do this as a practice. Just go home and type it on the, on the, in, on the internet, on the Bible gateway. Type the word hope for New Testament and see what happens. And it always linked with eternity. Eternity is always linked with hope. You cannot have faith and eternity except if it's a, it's, a, it's a promise. When, let me just go further, this study is not going to stop here. When a God gives a promise to someone <coughs> in specific, Rob, you will be with me today in paradise. What can Rob say? Lucky me, right? Yeah, yeah. There is any hope in that? No, no hope. Why? Because it's specifically said to him, personally. When God invited the disciples, the apostles, not, not apostles, the Israelites out of Egypt, he said, I'm going to give you the promised land. Did you think God was lying? God forbid. So what happened? All of the Israelites, except two, didn't make it. What happened to them? God promised them. It's called the promised land, right? He promised them the promised land. What happened to them on the way? They fell away. They didn't believe it. They lost their faith. So they didn't think that God would give it to them at one point. Not, not because God was not faithful. They couldn't because they have... There is a human factor in this. We don't count for. That's what confuses everybody. I'm still seeing the fine line in my mind. So if there's an if condition there. Yes. If I accept and if I keep working on it, then I should be sure of my salvation. Versus if I accept and I keep working on it, but yet I'm still not so sure. As long as I'm working on it, I should be sure. If I stop working on it, then I should, I should doubt. Here is the thing. Uh, my hope could sure. go less. One, one thing. Hope... Uh, St. Peter said something, hope will not be disappointed. It doesn't mean I'm hoping that I'm actually not, I'm giving up. Because I don't want to be childish in my mind. You know, uh, a child would go black or white. So I cancel hope. There's only <coughs> faith or no faith. But the Christian would say, no, there's faith and there's hope and there's no faith. But as a Christian, my, my hope is how I work out my salvation. Is that I keep working on it and I see it grow, and I get excited about it. And as the more I get excited about it, I think in my mind, ah, God's not going to disappoint me. But that's, that's what I'm saying. At that point, it's kind of a sure thing for you. It's no longer doubted. Because you've worked on it, you, God confirms that your hope is correct. So it is, you should live in uh, joy. Because of course. you know no. it is... It is, you will achieve that. Whereas if I'm not so sure, no, this is something working, different. Then the joy is not really That is different. I'll tell you why. Because hope is always linked with joy. If you read St. Paul carefully, he's going to say, and uh, let's go to Colossians. So this is important. Colossians? Paul's Philippians is about joy. Yes. Let's go to Colossians and I think we would we, we'll hear this. Uh, this is one of the verses that you can go to as a practice of this whole study. I'm just hoping that I explain the differences. Is it clear? The hope, faith, and love. There's, uh, we need the three of them. So go in verse uh, 4. He's always going to talk about love. Uh, Colossians 4 and uh, 5. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Well, what's, he, what's he bringing in? Faith and Right? What's missing? Hope. It's coming. Five. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Whenever he brings heaven, he's going to bring hope. So that is the key. If you read it really carefully, and I do believe that's how the apostles read it. 
uh, if we say something different, it would not be the apostolic teaching. Let me go further. Um, I want to say, uh, how about, he's excited about them. Maybe it is the Thessalonians. But th there's always going to be the three. Oh, go to Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Verse 3. Remembering without ceasing. Let's, let's look carefully at this. The work, you, without ceasing, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. So that the product of faith is work. If I don't believe in heaven, why, why should I work? But then, if I love, I would do much, much more work than just faith. I, I, I labor. But then if I hope, that how is hope tested? That I bear with things. Because I think St. Paul says something also. He says that your light affliction builds for you more and more weight of glory in heaven. So it is not, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not gray, so it's not black and white. There's a different shades of stuff. We're going to make it to heaven by building our salvation one thing at a time it is not disappointing it is not heavy it is not sad it is very joyful as a clever student that's what St. Paul keeps saying as one runs a race he is knowing that there's going to be a prize waiting for him but it's not only one prize there's plenty of prizes and each one will take a prize depending on how much he has put in and that gives me joy right okay I hope that answers. So the, the, that idea about joy, hope being uh, joyless, it's out of place, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, it's just that you hear it so much. No, it is. Ask someone about, are you sure of your salvation as long as you are in church and doing the deeds that you're asked to do? The answer will be, no, I'm not so sure of my salvation. I, I think you should say, I hope in Christ. That's and the I word. Exactly. That is the New Testament oh, way to find is in Christ. Yes. That's it. And, then, and and please, when you go home, each of you do this homework. Look up hope in the New Testament and see how it is linked consistently in the letters of the apostles with the, the heaven to come. I hope this explains it because uh, you, you would be so much kind of un not understanding what St. Paul is talking about. And every time he talks to the letters, he says, love, hope, faith. Faith is substance. Hope, my, my trying to attain it, to get it from myself. But when God says to me, Angelos, you're going to be doing this, 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 there's no place for hope. That's it. But he's saying to the whole church, not a specific person, and every one of us hope to get what he told us to get, the glory that he promised. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that I should be sad. No, not at all. When St. Paul says that all, everybody ran in the race, but one of them hopes to get the, the, the prize, he's meaning the highest prize, the highest prize. It is not black and white. Um, we should stop here. We have like five minutes for one more verse. Okay, one more verse, and then we'll be done because the last part, and this is very important. This is tied together. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The ne next part of this verse is. Uh, for God, who works in you both to will. For God who works it in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And we looked at this verse last time. And I said this is one of the memory verses. This verse and the one before it is very much important. What do you and what do you get when I say God God is the one who wills in you? Can anybody when I read this verse it makes me shiver. This is very significant. What does it mean that God wills in me? Does it evoke any kind of ideas, feelings? If I told you that God is, can, and He is, able to change your heart to want something from your heart, what would you say? I personally would say, well, what's not, what's preventing Him? You have to let Him. Exactly. So it's not only that. What else? Uh, 
I really need it. I really need to change my heart and to have him do his will in me. I want that, but why I can't? Why and many times I don't think God wills in me to sin. And many times I sin or get angry or frustrated for the silliest reasons or uh, envious or jealous or mad or whatever. Why God doesn't will in me good things? So these two things come to my mind. If I know that God wills in me, how should I use this? Invite him to work in me to fight sin and acquire virtues. This is the highest. I want him to come and knock down sin. Because he can. Because sin starts by me willing evil. Willing something against God's commandment. Yes? Does he work in you when you're weak and can't work in yourself? Work in me when I'm weak, when I can't work. Again, when? That's the question. When is that going to happen? When I open the door. You know that, uh, you know all of you, the, the, the picture of Christ knocking on a door and the knob is on the other side. You can't really have God force himself on you because he's not going to do that. He respects our free will so much. Then actually comes to my mind, I'm always thinking Jew. I, I, I don't have that. I have that tendency. So forgive me. When I go to something, a story that actually so much bother me, and I think I find a, a solution for this verse. How about fear? Why do you think? Huh? He closed the door. He closed the door from the beginning. He said, "This God of Israel, I don't know him. You coming to talk to me about God that I don't know him? I don't care to know him. Go let your God go away, and just you go away too." Is it to do his, use him to do his work? Others? Right, but he did not want God to change his heart. What Pharaoh should have done, because it says that God hardened his heart, what Pharaoh should have done said, he said, what did you Pharaoh used to say? Go tell God to stop the the plagues, the, the plagues, the whatever is happening around me. But he never asked for God to change his heart. He didn't think or believe that God can change his heart. If he just asked it once, but God, Pharaoh did never ask God to change his heart. He believed that God, he actually asked Moses, pray for me that the plagues would go away. He believed in a God that can change circumstances, but he didn't believe in God that can change a heart. That's one. So uh, this is answer to, you know, which, which verse, uh, this verse answer to another verse in St. Paul. It's written there, but I don't want you to see it. Just tell me without looking. I, I already invited you to look. What verse is this answer to? It's on the same subject. It's a famous verse. It's in Romans. Can you make it a little easier? He said, the good I will, I can't do. And the bad I don't want, that I do. So that verse actually... Answer. So instead of me trying to do the good that I'm convinced to do, who's going to do it? It's God in me that will actually do well and do. So he's resolving the issue that we had in Romans, which was a very difficult and confusing in Romans to understand. He said in Romans, uh, he says, uh, for what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. He see, he has the vision, but he doesn't have the practice. In Romans, he says, for the law, Romans 7.15, that was uh, 7.15. In 8, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the explanation that God actually wills and works in him for God's pleasure, not anymore for the flesh pleasure. That is the answer. The next question is how, what should I do to clean the place for God to work? Ask myself, why God is not working in me to will? Moses actually answered this one. He said, Consecrate yourselves today for the Lord, to the Lord, that He may bestow on you a blessing this day. How can I ask God to work in me when I'm not ready? St. Paul in his letter to Timothy, he says, Flee from all these sins, so and so and so and so, because whoever cleanses himself of these sins will be, remember the word? A useful vessel for God. Whenever we clean ourselves from sexual immorality, love of money, 
uh, and the whatever we try to strive to clean out. And I, maybe I should ask God first well, to kind of fight for me these sins. Then I'll be a tool for God to do His pleasure. That's why the willing first, then the work. I think one of the things I can do is to look at myself as is and see all that stuff in me that I need God to, to work on and go have a repentance and confession and come back and ask God to work through me as a clean vessel for Him. So it is God who wills and works in me to do according to His pleasure. If I understand this, what I will do? I want to leave you with this question. If God wills in me, changes my heart to will something different, what I would do? This is different, I think. Because I think we have a tendency to go and think, like I said, in one of the reasons why our salvation is in danger, because we think we can do it on our own. We go into the moralistic attitude, I can be good. No. Even St. Paul said, I cannot be good. How can I be good? Only one is good. That's Jesus' answer to the Pharisee. Don't call me the young man. Don't call me good. Why are you calling me good? Because that young man, he said, uh, a good teacher. And he thought Jesus was a man. Only one that is good. That's God. So I need the goodness of God to be invited to change me to become good. Cannot do it on my own. It's God who wills and works in you for his good pleasure. I want to leave you with this question. If you know this verse, think as a homework what you need to do to bring it to your life. Okay, glory be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Let's say our Father. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, make us worthy, Lord, say, thank thee, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, thine is the kingdom, power and glory, now forever. Amen. May the Lord God, the Father, and grace is only God, and Son, be the source, and the pleasure of our Lord, and the peace, peace be with you.